And here we are. And look, lots of people already lining up. We're a little bit late coming on to you because we were lining up people in Dublin. And uh, since there are four of us involved in this, it's a little bit more complex than usual. And as we all know, I am not the most technically minded person in the world. So I just sit back quietly and whimper while other people make it work. Anyway, it's lovely to see everybody, uh, everybody coming online. Uh, Mary Lou, hello, and Martha and Jim and David in Stratford upon Avon and all the usual people in Sheila from Wexford. It's wonderful to see you back. Thank you for joining us this week. As you know, we are we are all Irish this week, and uh, hence we've got the uh, the Irish uh, harpist Carolyn uh, regaling us with um, the divinity of Irish harp music. Well, I drink French coffee, but anyway, um, we're a little bit late, so we're going to be starting quite quickly because we've a lot to get through today. And as we know, the topic is John Billington Singh, remarkable Irish playwright, who um, was on the basis of the great die young, like Mozart, Singh died far too young, but left us with a mar remarkable body of work. So uh, we'll be coming to that in a moment. Who else is with us today? Mark Rochester's there. And Debbie, hello, Debbie. I'm racing through these. Bill and Joan, welcome back. We have some new people on today as well, which is delightful. Hello, Ray. Hello, Grace. Sunny evening in Dublin. Well, that's nice. Must be making a change. And for those of you who are not in Pittsburgh, after several days of continuous rain, we've actually got a sunny day as well, but not as hot as it was. Oh my God, that heat was appalling. <sighs> Hello, Bruce in New Haven. adjusting my bits and pieces here and knowing me I'll make a mess of it but I'm going. so we'll just wait a couple of more minutes because as we know a lot of people just tune in at two o'clock or whatever time it is in your particular part of the world uh, Hello, Craig. Nice to see you again. Yes, I know it's 7 p.m. in Dublin now, but it's, uh, it's, it's, well, people tend to tune in at this particular time, right, wherever they may be. Um, since we have people in Holland and we have people in Poland and we have one or two, somebody in India, I know. Uh, anyway, as far as I'm concerned, it's two in the afternoon of a Friday. Hello, Linda. Okay, we'll give it two more minutes and then we'll make a start. Hello, Karen in, in uh, Aspinall. Aspinwall, uh, launch it to you. Pete from DC. I'm sorry, I'm delighted. Uh, I'd like to say we had a very, very large um, registration for this week's seminar, which is very encouraging. Uh, and uh, there's another one, not just this week, but next week as well. We'll be doing two on Sing followed by three on Shakespeare, uh, where we're going to talk about King Lear. But uh, this week and next week, it's the glories of Irish theatre.
Thank you, Karen. We're thrilled that you're watching it. Yes, Peter, I love O'Carolyn too. They're gorgeous pieces. And this is a particularly good recording of it. Okay, I think we'll make a start. Um, we will we will fade out Mr. O'Carolyn and uh, let me introduce what we're up to today. Um, we have, uh, as you know, we, we sometimes do a multiple uh, webinar. This, this time we've got two weeks on a particular Irish writer. Um, I'm not going to say too much about it because that would be preempting uh, my guest. In fact, most of this webinar or this webinar is actually coming to you from Dublin. Um, we have three people in, in, involved in it. We have uh, our, our particular uh, co-host is Aoife Spillan Hinks, um, who uh, you can read all about her on the website. I'm not going to go too much into it, but she's a remarkably talented young woman from America, now living in Ireland, living married and in Ireland for good. But for those of you who are Picked audience members, she has directed uh, three productions with us here at Picked: uh, Our Class, Waiting for Godot, and Sharon's Grave, the John B. Keane play. She is an authority on Irish folklore and folk theatre, and I'm thrilled that she's going to join us. And um, on top of that, we have uh, she's invited two Irish actors to to uh, to read for us some sections from Playboy of the Western World. Uh, we have uh, Mae Fitzgerald remarkable actress and Sean Doyle a remarkable actor I know I would say that but I actually mean it these are two really really fine talents from Irish theatre and we're very privileged that they're reading for us today so with uh, without any more ado as they say uh, I'm going to introduce you to Aoife Spillane Hinks. Aoife. Thank you Alan um, thanks everyone for joining today and hello or good evening from Dublin um, I'm going to jump straight into it because there's a lot to say um, and I want to make sure we've got time for all of it. Um, if you have any difficulties with my connection, um, I'm exceedingly concerned that my internet will cut out at some stage. So just let me know in the chat and I will run and find a different place in the house to record from. So my name is Eva Spillan Hinks. I am a theatre director. And my background is that I was born in New Haven, Connecticut, and grew up there. And I studied folklore and mythology at Harvard University. And I focused on John Millington Singh while I was there. And while I studied him, I did research in the archives at Trinity College Dublin, looking at his notebooks and his letters. And I also studied Irish in Carraro, a small town in the Connemara Gaeltacht which uh, it, which is one of the areas where people speak Irish, the language that transformed Singh's English into poetry. And over the course of two summers, I carried out my own ethnographic fieldwork on Singh's beloved Inish man, during which I looked after the 300-year-old cottage where Singh had rented a room, reading his words written a century earlier as I sat by the same hearth at which he learned the narratives of the island and the language of the west of Ireland. And after graduation, I moved to Galway and then I moved to Dublin and I have been here working as a director ever since. So one term that I just want to make sure uh, we're all on the same page about is ethnographic fieldwork. Um, for those unfamiliar with the term, it refers to the practical hands-on side of anthropological research in which a researcher lives with, or at least spends a significant portion of time with a group of people about whom they're studying. So a little about John Millington Singh. He was born in 1871 in Rathfarnham, a Dublin suburb, and he was the youngest of five children and a very sickly child. Um, from a young age, he was ambivalent about the privilege into which he was born and about Christianity, which was deeply important to his evangelical Protestant family. And actually, he read Darwin's work, which had only been around for a few decades at that stage, when he was a teenager. And he wrote in his diary all about the ecstasy of confusion and epiphany that he experienced because of this writing. And Darwin inspires Singh's flight from his church-bound family. 
So he graduates from Trinity College Dublin in 1892 with prizes in the Irish language. And having studied violin at the Royal Irish Academy of Music while he was at Trinity, he travels to Germany to further develop his violin skills, probably in hopes of becoming a concert violinist. Now, this is one of the several things he tries to do before he gets on the thing that he is actually good at doing. So he wrote later that, I saw that the Germans were so much more innately gifted with the musical faculties than I was, that I decided to give up music and take to literature instead. And so his next focus was that he was going to write about French poetry. So in 1895, January 1895, 24 years old, he moves to Paris to become a critic of French poetry. But once again, a voice told him that he would never be first rate. And that voice belonged to the Irish poet William but Butler Yeats. And while in Paris in 1896, Singh meets Yeats, and he was already a prominent member of the Irish cultural and political scene at that stage. And Yeats later recalled that in Paris, he told Singh to go to the Aran Islands, give up the French poetry and go to the Aran Islands, which are a group of islands which lie off the west coast of Ireland, nestled in Galway Bay, situated below County Galway and above County Clare. Now, I will say that story about Yeats, Yeats is telling this story to people after Singh is dead. So it might not have been Yeats who got him to the Aran Islands, but Yeats, possibly very typical to his nature, rewrote the story so that he's in the middle. But anyway, Singh gets to the Aran Islands and he makes his first visit in 1898, returning again every summer until 1902. And of the three Aran Islands, Singh spent most of his time on the middle island in Ishman and developed intimate personal relationships with people there. Although he had been trying to work as a writer and to, to find his inspiration before this 1898 visit, it's only after he goes to Inish Man that he starts to write his famous plays and prose, most notably his most famous piece of nonfiction writing, which is called The Aran Islands, as well as his six plays, including The Playboy of the Western World. He died of Hodgkin's disease 11 years later at the age of 37. But during those 11 productive years, he was in the vanguard of the emerging Irish theater movement. I wanna talk a little bit about Singh's European influences. You know, we think about him so much ensconced in the Irish uh, literary movement and the Irish historical moment, but he had a deep relationship with what was going on in the continent. So really, this whole road was paved by continental Europeans. He read widely in European literature, philosophy, and science. He played the music of German, French, and Italian masters. And he came of intellectual age as writers, visual artists, and musicians across Europe were looking to explore their country's folkways, often with a connection with nationalism. And examples of this are Hungarian composer, composer Béla Bartók, Russian writer Leo Tolstoy, Norwegian playwright Henrik Ibsen. And Singh was also consistently engaged with the great masters of 19th century science and political thinking, Charles Darwin and Karl Marx. And in terms of anthropological reading, he read the seminal text, The Golden Bough by James Fraser, a Scottish anthropologist whose comparative approach placed primitive cultures on the lower end of an evolutionary, evolutionary spectrum, um, very emblematic of late 19th century anthropology. But I have to say, this is not how Singh approached the idea of ethnography or the idea of different kinds of cultures. Um, something we'll talk a bit more about next week. Really important influence from the continent. Impressionism, this is so important. Think about this, it's the emphasis on the artist's own perspective rather than on the articulation of some empirical truth. Robert Tracy, the scholar, writes in a, one of his introductions to a collection of Singh's nonfiction the following. In Paris, the series of the impressionist painters, especially Monet, Manet, and Renoir, were constantly being discussed in the circles in which Singh moved. He went to the galleries again and again to look at their paintings. 
And these paintings were important to determining his way of looking at reality. This is not photographic realism. Impressionist artists thought of their task as not merely rendering things as they were, but things as they were seen by the painters themselves. Right, we, we see the painters' brushstrokes. They're very apparent. They're acknowledging their own experience of making the art. And similarly with Singh, Robert Tracy again writes, the reader of the Aran Islands ends knowing something of how the islanders lived and felt, but far more how things looked and sounded to John Singh. Now, can I just check in? Can everybody still hear me? If someone wants to say in the chat, I'm terribly worried that I've, 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 uh, I have blacked out. Brilliant, thank you. <laughs> okay, so let's talk about Inish Man. So today, oh, thank you, well, brilliant, loads of affirmations, thank you. I was really paranoid there. Um, so, so Inish Man, today in Sing, as, as in Singh's day, Inish Man remains the least commercially developed of the three islands, and Irish is still the predominant language that's spoken. Now, back in Singh's time, scholars flocked to these islands, and especially to Inishman, to study Irish. Inishman's residents were renowned for the purity and the vigor of their spoken Irish. And one islandman said to Singh at the time, he said, quote, there are few men, there are few rich men now in the world who are not studying the Gaelic. And the three-room cottage, which Singh shared with Breej and Paji Nachtanacha and their family on Inishman, was known as Olskol Nagelga, which is the University of Irish, because so many intellectuals had already stayed there to absorb the language of the household. Singh was a lifelong journaler, and on Inishman, he recorded stories that he heard, snippets of conversations, and his own descriptions and observations of the countryside and its people. So I'll tell you a little bit about the play, The Playboy. Although Singh sets the Playboy of the Western world on a wild coast of Mayo, which is further up the coast on the Western coast, much of the substance of the play comes from Singh's fieldwork on Inishman. In 1907, the Aran Islands are published after several years' delay. And also in 1907 is the world premiere of the Playboy of the Western World at the Abbey Theatre. So here's a bit of a summary of the Playboy. Peggy and Mike lives with her dad and helps him run his shibin, or a small rural pub. She appears doomed never to see beyond her tiny village until an intriguing stranger named Christy Mahan shows up at the Shabin with a thrilling tale. He claims that he has killed his father. The telling of that story has the transformational effect on the village. The village seems to enter into a state of carnival in which orderly village life is upended. Predictability and piety are replaced by chaos and imagination and Peggy falls in love with Christy. But, Christie's father is not dead and shows up in the town the next day, ready to fight his son. Christie's tale is revealed as a fraud and he is pitched out of town. Now, before I go on, I'd like to ask Alan to read Singh's rousing introduction that he wrote to the script of the Playboy of the Western World. My microphone on there. Can you hear me? Yes. In writing The Playboy of the Western World, as in my other plays, I have used one or two words only that I have not heard among the country people of Ireland or spoken in my own nursery before I could read the newspapers. A certain number of the phrases I employ I have heard also from herds and fishermen along the coast from Kerry to Mayo, or from beggar women and ballad singers near Dublin. And I am glad to acknowledge how much I owe to the, to the folk imagination of these fine people. Anyone who has lived in real intimacy with the Irish peasantry will know that the wildest sayings and ideas in this play are tame indeed, compared with the fancies one may hear in any little hillside cabin in Gisala or Caharo or Dingle Bay. All art is a collaboration, and there is little doubt that in the happy ages of literature, striking and beautiful phrases were as ready to the storytellers or the playwright's hand as the rich cloaks and dresses of his time. It is probable 
that when the Elizabethan dramatist took his ink horn and sat down to his work, he used many phrases that he had just heard as he sat at dinner from his mother or his children. In Ireland, those of us who know the people have the same privilege. When I was writing Shadow of the Glen some years ago, I got more aid than any learning could have given me from a chink in the floor of the old Wicklow house where I was staying that let me hear what was being said by the servant girls in the kitchen. This matter, I think, is of importance. For in countries where the imagination of the people and the language they use is rich and living, it is possible for a writer to be rich and copious in his words, and at the same time, to give the reality, which is the root of all poetry, in a comprehensive and natural form. In the modern literature of towns, however, richness is found only in sonnets or prose poems or in one or two elaborate books that are far away from the profound and common interests of life. One has on one side Malmarm or Huisman producing this literature and on the other Ibsen and Zola dealing with the reality of life in joyless and pallid words. On the stage, one must have reality and one must have joy. And that is why the intellectual modern drama has failed and people have grown sick of the false joy of the musical comedy that has been given them in place of the rich joy found only in what is superb and wild in reality. In a good play, every speech should be as fully flavored as a nut or an apple. And such speeches cannot be written by anyone who works among people who have shut their lips on poetry. In Ireland, for a few years more, we have a popular imagination that is fiery and magnificent and tender. So that those of us who wish to write start with a chance that is not given to writers in places where the springtime of the local life has been forgotten and the harvest is a memory only and the straw has been turned to bricks. We're back to Aoife, you're there. You disappeared on me. Nope, Aoife seems to have disappeared. Right, we're going to hold on for a second because as we predicted, she might have had a problem. But uh, anyway, that was the uh, introduction that uh, John Wellington Singh wrote to his, his uh, first publication of uh, Playboy of the Western World, which I think um, really does sum up something rather special that Eva, Eva was talking about. That when she talks about, and when he talks about reality, we're not talking about realism in the conventional sense, the architectural sense, but in the impressionistic sense of finding the, the realism of language and the realism of emotions is expressed by people in their natural way of talking, in their natural way of behaving. Um, have we got any sign of her? Is she coming back to us yet? Let me know, we've got a question coming in, so we'll have a look at that. Uh, I think that's what we might do. I think what we'll do while we're trying to get Aoife back again, we have these two wonderful actors, Maeve and Sean, who are going to read some segments of the play. So I know I may be jumping ahead of where um, Aoife wanted to be, but let's go on to the first extract. And if, if, uh, if our two actors are there and ready and can switch on their cameras and their microphones, uh, we seem to be having a very interesting time. There is Maeve and there is Sean. So Maeve and Sean, well, we're trying to get Aoife back online again. Um, would you like to, uh, we, this is the, um, this is the, uh, the, I think this is the first major co uh, conversation between the two characters in the play. Aoife's back. We, are you there with us? Can we hear you? Yes. <laughs> we were about to move on to Maeve and Sean, if that's where you'd like to go next. Uh, would it be all right if, if I jump in? Yes, by all means, it's your program. <laughs> Lovely. Hello. Okay, let's hope that that doesn't happen again. So, thank you, Alan. I, I mean, this this introduction to the play, it's such an absolutely inspiring and galvanizing treatise on what theater, what art, what language, what expression should be. And uh, it's so much more than simply an artist talking about how he created something. He places collaboration and multi-authorship at the center of the work that his name might be the one name on the title, uh, on, on the byline, um, but it's the product of a lot of conversations. Is my video okay now? I see Linda's, Linda's message. 
Great, super. So when the Playboy premiered at the Abbey in Dublin in January 1907, um, there was an, uh, the audiences uh, rioted for a week. And largely people talk about a line that Christie says near the end of the play where he refers to, what did I care if you brought me a drift of chosen females standing in their shifts itself? So he's conjuring up this idea of these women standing in their undergarments. Um, and every night, noisy protesters filled the theater and made the play inaudible, though the actors continued with the performance. Now, a scholar named Paige Reynolds has the following argument, which I think is very interesting. And she says, although modern critics have linked the controversy to factors ranging from rising unionist anxiety about home rule to factors uh, to, uh, to a growing awareness of venereal disease, the most important cause was the Dubliners' outrage that their national theater had offered its public an offensive and unflattering picture of Irish rural life, rather than an affirmative depiction of national folk culture. Singh was not just creating propaganda, he was creating living art based on lived life. And this idea of you're not showing Ireland properly on the national stage is one that has continued through to the present day, these arguments about, are we being shown badly by this play or that play? We're not focusing on the riots in this talk. Um, so there's lots to learn about that, but we won't be spending much time on that. Um, in his process, he calls this process of writing a collaboration in which the residents of the Aran Islands and other rural areas lend a hand. These people taught Singh how to think about community. They pointed out the similarities and the connections between uh, the countryside and the city. And they allowed Singh to hear their stories and see their lives. So Singh straddles this urban and these urban and rural worlds when he made his theater. And he's one of Ireland's many vagrants, finding a home nowhere, but finding new stories everywhere. And this idea of tramps of wanderers is something I want to touch a little bit more on. The figure of the traveling person, like Christie in the in the Playboy, is omnipresent in Irish culture. You have tramps, individual homeless people who beg for food and shelter along the road, travelers, a distinct Irish cultural group whose people have traveled Ireland for centuries and do so to this day, setting up temporary living situations. At the time, you would have had the ghosts of the Great Famine, the memories of starving, barely clothed skeletons staggering through the countryside. And you would have had evicted families, put out by evictions imposed by their English landlords. And Singh witnessed evictions on an Ishman, and he knew, as any Irish person would, the terrible and relatively recent stories of the famine. And in terms of evictions, If, uh, if you can hear me, just reconnect, please. Press reconnect. Sorry about this, everybody, but as we say, it's technology, and in the great scheme of things, all this is very new technology. We're all learning about it. Uh, so I do apologize, but we'll get back. And Am I back? Yes, you're, I'm going to keep talking to you while you're talking. I'm going to keep with you just to make sure you know.
All good? Can they hear me? It is on. You can start reading. Can you hear us? Yes. Great. You're okay. on. Okay, so this is uh, Peggy and, and Christy from Act One. Let you stretch out now by the fire, young fellow. You should be destroyed traveling. I'm tired, surely. Walking wild 11 days and waking fearful in the night. You should have great people in your family, I'm thinking, with the little small feet you have, and you with a kind of quality name, the like of what you'd find on the great powers and potentates of France and Spain. We were great, surely, in wide and windy acres of rich monster land. Wasn't I telling you? And you a fine, handsome young fellow with a noble brow. Is it me? I? Did you never hear that from the young girls where you come from in the West or so? I did not then. Oh, they're bloody liars in the naked parish where I grew them in. If they are itself. You've heard it these days, I'm thinking. And you walking the world telling out your story to young girls or old. I've told my story no place till this night, Peggy and Mike. And it's foolish I was here, maybe, to be talking free, but you're decent people, I'm thinking. And yourself a kindly woman, the way I wasn't fearing you at all. You've said the like of that, maybe, in every cot and cabin where you've met a young girl on your way. I've said it nowhere till this night. And I'm telling you, for I've seen none the like of you the eleven long days I'm walking the world, looking over a low ditch or a high ditch on my north or my south, the stormy scattered fields or scribes of bog where you'd see young limber girls and fine prancing women making laughter with the men if you weren't destroyed traveling you'd have as much talk and streeling i'm thinking as Owen Roe sullivan or the poets of the dingle bay and i've heard all times that the poets are your like fine fiery fellows with great rages when their tempers roused you have a power of rings, God bless you. And would there be any offence if I was asking, are you single now? What would I want wedding so young? You're alike so. I never killed my father. I'd be a fear to do that. Except I was the like of yourself with blind rages tearing me within. For I'm thinking you should have had great tussling when the end was come. We had not then. It was a hard woman who come over the hill, and if he was always a crusty kind when he'd a uh, hard woman setting him on, not the devil himself or his forefathers could put up with him at all. And isn't it a wonder that one wasn't fearing you? Up to the day I killed my father, there wasn't a person in Ireland knew the kind I was. And I there drinking, waking, eating, sleeping, a quiet, simple, poor fellow with no man giving me heed. It was the girls giving you heed, maybe. And I'm thinking it's most conceit you'd have to be gaming with their like. Not the girls itself, I won't tell you a lie. There wasn't anyone heeding me in that place, saving only the dumb beasts of the field. And I was thinking you should have been living the like of a king of Norway or the eastern world <laughs> the like of a king is it and i after toiling moiling digging dodging from dawn till dusk with never a sight of joy or sport saving only when i'd be abroad in the dark night poaching rabbits and hills for i was a devil to poach god forgive me and i near got six months for doing with the dung fork and stabbing a fish and it's that you'd call sport is it to be abroad in the darkness with yourself alone. I did. God help me. And there I'd be as happy as the sunshine of St. Martin's Day, watching the light passing the north, or the patches of fog, till I'd hear a rabbit starting to screech and I'd go running in the forest. Then when I'd my full share, I'd come walking down where you'd see the ducks and geese stretched, sleeping on the highway of the road. 
and before I'd pass the dunghill, I'd hear himself snoring out. A loud, lonesome snore he'd be making at all times the while he was sleeping. And he, a man, be raging all the time while he was waking. Like a gaudy officer, you'd hear cursing and damning and swearing oaths. Providence and mercy spare us all. Oh, it's that you'd say surely if you'd seen him. And he, after drinking for weeks, rising up in the red dawn, or before it may be, and going out into the yard as naked as an ash tree in the moon of May, shying clods against the visage of the stars till he put the fear of death into the banners and the screeching sows. Well, I'd be well nigh afeard of that lad myself, I'm thinking. And there was no one in it but the two of you alone. The devil of one. Though he had sons and daughters walking all great states and territories of the world, and not a one of them to this day but would say their seven curses on him, and they rousing up to let a cough or a sneeze maybe in the darkness of the night. Well, you should have been a queer lot. I never cursed my father the like of that, though I'm twenty and more years of age. Then you'd have cursed mine, I'm telling you. And he a man never gave peace to any, saving when he'd get two months or three, or be locked in the asylums for battering peelers or assaulting men. The way it was a bitter life he led me till I did, up a Tuesday and have his skull. Well, you'll have peace in this place, Christy Mahan, and none to trouble you. And it's near time a fine lad like you should have your good share of the earth. It is time, surely. And I a seemly fellow with great strength in me and bravery of... Oh, glory. It's late for knocking. And this last while I'm in terror of peelers and the walking dead. So, so we see Christy as Pegin first meets him here. Um, someone who is coming from a life of real marginal uh, existence, real unhappiness, real isolation, definitely not uh, a hero of any story of, or any play. Um, but over the course of the scene, we see how he responds to Pegin's response to him and to his story. And he starts to learn how to think of himself, or at least take the first few steps towards thinking of himself as somebody who could be the hero of a story. So we might just jump straight into the next scene, which is in Act Two. And Maeve this time will be playing the Widow Quinn rather than Pegin. Um, and she's speaking with Christy. So we'll take it away. Can I just double check? Is my audio okay now? It's quite low, Sean. And Aoife, would you mute your audio? Yeah, sorry, sorry. I, I, I didn't realize I was my audio was still on when I wasn't on screen. Apologies, is that better now or do you want that's to let better, me? Sean, yeah, that's perfect. Okay, sorry about that. Great. Okay, so it's uh, Widow Quinn and Christy from Act Two. Are you fasting or fed, young fellow? Fasting, if you please. Well, you're the lot. Stir up now and give him his breakfast. Come here to me. And tell us your story before Pegine will come, in place of grinning your ears off like the moon of May. Well, it's a long story. You'd be destroyed listening. Don't be letting on to be shy. A fine, gamey, treacherous lad, the like of you. Was it in your house beyond you practice skull? It was not. We were digging spuds in his cold, sloping, stony devil's patch of a field. And you went asking money of him, or making talk of getting a wife would drive him from his far? Oh, I did not then, but there I was digging and digging. And you squinting idiot, says he, let you walk down now and tell the priest you'll wed the widow Casey in a score of days. What kind was she? She's a walking terror from beyond the hills, and she two score and five years and two hundred weights and five pounds in the weighing scales, with a limping leg on her. And a blinded eye, and, and she a woman of noted misbehaviour with the old and the young. What did he want driving you to wed with her? He was letting on I was wanting a protector from the harshness of the world. 
And he without a thought the whole while, but now we'd have her hut to live in and her gold to drink. And it may be worse than a dry heart and a widow woman and your glass at night. So you hit him then? I did not. I, I won't weather, says I. When all know she did suckle me for six weeks when I came into this world, and she a hag this day with the tongue on her has the crows and seabirds scattered, the way they wouldn't cast a shadow on her garden with the dread of her curse. That one should be right company. She's too good for the likes of you, says he, and go on now or I'll flatten you out like a crawling beast has passed under a dray. You will not if I can help it, says I. Go on, says he, or I'll have the devil making garters of your limbs tonight. You will not if I can help it, says I. You were right, surely. And with that, the sun came out between the cloud and the hill, and it's shining green in my face. God have mercy on your soul, says he, lifting a scythe. Or on your own, says I, raising the loy. That's a grand story, you tell it lovely. He gave a drive with the scythe, and I gave a lep to the east. Then I turned around with my back to the north, and I hit a blow on the ridge of Ishkul. Laid him stretched out, and he split to the knob of his gullet. Over muting because I'm so traumatized from my unmuted experience. Um, so, so anyway, um, he's now, he's now come on leaps and bounds out of himself and into this position of heroism, right? He's nearly become a cinematographer. He's saying with that, the sun came out between the cloud and the hill and it's shining green in my face. God have mercy on your soul, says he, lifting a scythe, or on your own, says I, raising the loy. I mean, this is, this is like action movie kind of stuff. And he's gotten this far, not only in the way of telling the story, but in how he places it himself into it. And there, therefore, how he begins to see himself. So this performative act that is transforming the villager's idea of him, it's, it's also then transforming his own sense of himself and what he's capable of, which will then make him capable. Having gone from that sad boy, that sad scrawny boy living on the edge of, of the earth, living on the edge of civilization, feared of everybody, laughed at by everybody, to this guy, to the guy who we're about to see, who goes on, goes out to all the games and all the races and wins everything. He, so so what, we, what, what we're gonna see now in act three is after he's gone and won the races, I don't know whether this guy had ever been able to win a race, had ever been able to, to win anything um, before these last couple of days. And here he is now coming back the champion. He's full of oxygen. He's breathing heavily. The blood is, throwing, uh, uh, is, is thrumming through his veins, as is the blood thrumming through the veins of Peggy. So we see Peggy again. It's Peggy and Christy, and they've come in from his victory on the beach at the races. Let's have a look at Act Three. So this is Peggy and Christy from Act Three. Well, you're the lad, and you'll have great times from this out when you could win that wealth of prizes and you sweating in the heat of noon. I'll have great times if I win the crowning prize I'm seeking now. And that's your promise, that you'll wed me in a fortnight when our bands is called. You have a right daring to go ask me that. <laughs> when all knows you'll be starting to some other girl in your own townland when your father's rotten in four months or five. Starting from you, is it? I will not then. And when the airs is warming in four months or five, it's then yourself and me should be pacing Nathan in the dews of night. The time sweet smells to be rising. And you see a little shiny new moon, maybe, sinking on the hills. And it's that kind of a poacher's love you'd make, Christy man. 
<laughs> on the sides and neffing when the night is down. It's little you'd think if my love's a poacher's or an earl's itself, when you'll feel my two hands stretched around you, and I squeezing kisses on your puckered lips till I'd feel a kind of pity for the Lord God is all ages sitting lonesome in his golden chair. And that'll be right fun, Christy Mahan. <sighs> And any girl would walk her heart out before she'd meet a young man was your like for eloquence or talk at all. Let you wait to hear me talking till we're astray in Eris, when Good Friday's by drinking a sup from a well and making mighty kisses with our wetted mouths, or gaming in a gap of sunshine, with yourself stretched back into your necklace in the flowers of earth. I'd be nice, so, is it? If the mitred bishops seen you that time, they'd be the like of the holy prophets, I'm thinking, to be straying in the bars of paradise to lay eyes on the Lady Helen of Troy, and she abroad pacing back and forth with the nosegay in her golden shawl. And what is it I have, Christy Mahan, to make me fitting entertainment for the likes of you, that has such poets talking? And such bravery of heart. Isn't that the light of seven heavens in your heart alone? The way you'll be an angel's lamp to me from this out. And I abroad in the darkness, spearing salmons in the own or the caramore. If I was your wife, I'd be along with you those nights, Christy Mahan. The way you'd see I was a great hand at coaxing bailiffs or... Or coining funny nicknames for the stars of night. You, is it? Taking your death in the hailstones or in the fogs of dawn. Yourself and me would find shelter easy in a narrow bush. But we're only talking, maybe. For this would be a poor thatched place to hold a fine lad is the like of you. If I wasn't a good Christian, it's on my naked knees I'd be saying my prayers and paters to every jack straw you have roofing your head and every stony pebble is paving the laneway to your door. If that's the truth, I'll be burning candles from this out to the miracles of God that have brought you from the south today. And I, with my gowns bought ready the way that I can wed you, and not wait at all. It's miracles. And that's the truth. Me there toiling a long way, a long while, and walking a long while, not knowing at all I was drawing all times nearer to this holy day. And myself, a girl, was tempted often to go sailing the seas till I'd marry a Jew man <laughs> with ten kegs of gold. And I not knowing at all there was the like of you drawing nearer. Like the stars of God. And to think I'm long years hearing women talking that talk to all bloody fools. And this is the first time I've heard the like of your voice talking sweetly for my own delight. And to think it's me talking sweetly, Christy man. <laughs> and I the fright of seven town lens from my biting tongue. <laughs> well, the heart's a wonder. And I'm thinking there won't be our like in Mayo for gallant lovers from this hour today. I was all alone. Um, it's just such a beautiful scene. Um, and, uh, you know, um, if you think about if only the play ended there and Christie's father didn't come in to uh, upend everything. Um, and, you know, and we've really focused on Christie here because, you know, an hour's no time at all. And the idea of the storytelling and everything else is so important to talk about. But you can see here for Peggy, um, you know, Again, we don't have the time to talk about what it was like for a woman in the West of Ireland at that time, 
Um, the whole play, you can see there are no fit men for her to marry in this town. There's been the famine not so long ago that's wiped out, that's undermined this whole population. And you have scores of men leaving to, leaving to foreign shores to find work, to find some kind of survival. And you have a woman here who has this man who seems like the most perfect lover, um, the most perfect hero. Um, and for one moment, it's all perfect. Um, if anybody saw um, uh, Sharon's grave a couple of years ago, back in 2015, uh, by J.B. Keane, it's very similar to the scene that Trassi and Patter have, that kind of unbelievable opening of hearts, um, if, only, if only the world didn't intervene. Um, Alan, do you want to come in? I know we're nearly at time, but, but will we have a bit of a chat? I think you need to unmute. Well, you see, this machine, this thing keeps deciding what it wants to do. No, I was saying we always go a little bit over time, and don't worry about it. I mean, I agree with you. That particular, it's extraordinary, the line of development from the weak little man that comes into the Shibin at the beginning to that scene that is a most beautiful love scene. This is Romeo and Juliet. This is... Um, it's it's extraordinary the language that they use and what i love about it in particular is that he captures in a way the realization and that's why his sense of reality this you know this impressionistic reality but he captures that moment when people realize that they themselves are changing have changed when peggy says you know i you know me the you know the when she sort of says she's the bitch the bitch uh, of the townlands, and suddenly here she is speaking love poetry that she's she's experiencing yeah. like in the moment. I think it's uh, I think it's exquisite writing, and it is part and parcel of 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 the, the you know what Singh is the 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 perfect example of the capacity of to tell a story about the telling of a story. Uh, to use the the very format that is the topic of the format that he is he, he is has a very cumbersome way of saying it, but this this play in itself is 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 a work of art purely in the art of storytelling. If mm. nothing, even if you're taking the story aside, I have a, one question from one of our regulars uh, in the the thing that you asked me to read, which was Singh's own preface to Playboy. He talks about uh, only one or two words that he didn't hear, uh, what were the one or two words? I mean, uh, it's probably slight hyperbole, but um, it is actually true, isn't it, that the majority of the language uh, was what he, he heard spoken in the Aran Islands, that, he, that uh, there, there are very few words in the play that would be um, of, of, a, of an urban origin you're frozen again oh no you're back yes uh most of the almost all of the language that he uses is in fact uh, you you described it earlier on this uh, capacity to take the irish language and to convert it into english but idi idiomatically maintaining that irish lilt to it yes yeah um, um and so I don't think I don't think uh, I mean, we may not be able to say to, to tell uh, Dennis which two words, but I think it's probably true to say there were only a couple of words in the whole exercise that were uh, were not from the West. Absolutely, absolutely, and um, I think that again, you know, and this is something we'll talk about next week with with writers to the sea, but Singh defies over and over again. Um, this idea of the author or the ethnographer, the anthropologist. Yeah. He, he defies this as this authorial, interpretive, empirical role. He, he is one of many that makes any of the pieces that he has his name on, you know? Yeah. And I think it's, it's a radical position to take. And I think yeah. that the way in which he uses language and the way in which he constructs his characters and his narratives bear out that much more radical view of what these stories can do and what 
these plays and what theater can do than a lot of his contemporaries. There's a point here. Uh, uh, there's a question here. Uh, has it ever been effectively translated and produced in Irish? I think it has. I know that Riders to the Sea was because I think it was Conal Morrison actually translated it. Uh, they did it at the Peacock a long time ago. I'm not sure about Playboy the Western World, but um, it must have been. I, I, I can only imagine it has. Um, but one, one thing that's related to that, that I learned donkeys years ago, that I think is really fascinating is there was a translation into French and the way that they made the translation into French was that they first translated it into Breton and then used Breton syntax and kind of idiomatic uh, framework to then translate it into French. For so those I don't who know, are aware, by the way, Breton uh, in that northern part of Brittany, the northern part of France, the bit that sticks up, uh, is Celtic. Um, yeah. And the, the, the Breton tongue is a Celtic language. Same with northern Spain, Galicia, northern Spain, uh, has, a, has a Celtic um, uh, uh, element to its, its culture and its language. So you, you find these, uh, it's interesting that tra translating into Breton would actually, yeah. it's translating it into a new version of itself and then into French. Yeah, yeah. I think it's very, very clever. Uh, I'd never, uh, Dennis again, I'd never heard the phrase donkey's years before. God. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's something to do with the longevity of the donkey. I think it's the year longevity as opposed to any other longevity a donkey may have. But it's um, it's uh, it's a very funny, yeah, it is a funny little phrase. No, definitely years. <laughs> anyway, um, yes, and we any other questions coming in? Uh, no, I think we're, we're done. Now, I want to talk just very briefly uh, as a kind of a hook on to next week, because I just mentioned the play, uh, which is uh, you're going to be covering, which is another of, of, of the, what I, I we, we, to my mind, the other truly great uh, play by, by, uh, by Singh, which is Riders to the Sea, a much shorter piece, uh, essentially a, um, uh, you, uh, you could call a one act play, but um, again, set in that barren poverty and here giving voice to the to women giving women the opportunity uh to express themselves in a society where the woman was very much subservient to the man do you want to say a quick word so that we can hook people into that for next week so next week we will be looking at um in particular the traditional irish um tradition of keening and the funeral rituals which Singh depicts on stage with Riders to the Sea. Um, some of the questions that we were asking today about how you take ethnographic material like his experiences on the Aran Island and put them into a play, that's some of what we're going to be looking at in more specifics next week. Um, how do you capture this on stage? But also we'll be looking at what those spaces are, what those funereal spaces are, um, and what possibilities they offer for articulation of rage, of different kinds of protest for women um, through these extreme vocal acts like scheming. Um, but Singh finds a really fascinating way of depicting this on stage, something that is unless you were going to go out to a rural area where this was still practiced, you weren't going to be seen if you lived in Dublin. Yeah, it's a uh, uh, point, and we'll discuss it more in depth next week, but it is true. It's, it's one of those aspects of what I tend to use the sort of generic term folk drama, and it's true of Singh, it's true of John B. Keane, that a lot of the practices and a lot of the, um, the social interaction that you get in his plays or in the plays of Keane or any other folk writer, are there is a universality to them. Just as there is a universality to urban living, there is a universality to, to rural and especially extreme rural living. Yeah. Um, that would be, uh, you know, what we're going to talk about next week with Riders to the Sea can be as true of Native American culture. Um, yeah. or Greek, of, Traditional uh, Greek culture. Traditional Greek culture. And, and yeah. anywhere, anywhere where grief is, a, a, a particular 
form of expression as opposed to uh, inner feeling. When it's a form of expression, it, there is a universality. Anyway, let's not preempt ourselves. Uh, we're getting some wonderful comments in. Thank you all. Um, I want to actually, we may have just one, and something's being slipped to me even as I speak. Um, yes, uh, two questions here. How long? Considering the fact that uh, that the, there were the, the the Playboy riots when people were objecting to the use of the word "shift," meaning underwear, and um, uh, as we heard last week when we were talking about um, the formation of the Abbey Theatre, when they toured it originally in America, it was actually banned in Philadelphia. They wouldn't let it go on the stage, um, and there were there were problems when it was in New York and uh, and and other places. Uh, but how long did it take for the Playboy to be embraced, for it to become accepted as culture? In, term, uh, in terms of the fact that the, a lot of people rejected the fact that it was portraying an Ireland they didn't want to acknowledge. Well, I am, I'm not sure about that particular transformation. And I am also, I'm not a scholar, I'm not a historian of Irish theatre. And uh, this was before my time, what I'm going to refer to, that I always thought about the Druid theater productions in the 1980s. Now, Druid uh, is a company that's still going strong and is based out in Galway in the west of Ireland. I had always had an understanding and a sense that the Druid productions of things that happened in the 80s kind of transformed the relate the sort of cultural relationship with Singh to a certain extent, um, and 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 pulled it into the 20th century in a way that it kind of I think had a people had had a sense that it was a bit dusty and and part of an older tradition. Um, but and Druid has continued as I think Maeve and a couple of folks are posting in the chat that Druid Singh, which happened in the early 2000s around 2005 2006, that was. Uh, the full palette of all of Singh's plays Druid did uh, in one full production. Um, so they've been continuing to do this work. But I think the 80s, they really transformed his uh, reputation and the legacy of the play. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The other one, um, so there's, are there any good recordings of Keening as a, as a thing? I don't know, but we will, uh, I don't know if you know of any, but... That's it. Yeah, we'll that's a great question. For ...people next week. Yeah, it's, it's a great thing to know for now, and we'll have a look. We'll see what we can find. Uh, yeah. It is an extraordinary thing when it is when you hear it. Um, so that's it. So, ladies and gentlemen, thank you all. Um, as usual, we've gone beyond our time. I don't care because I love doing this, and it's great. I want to say thank you to Aoife, and she's going to be back with us next week talking about Riders to the Sea and this, this whole cultural expression of grief, uh, the, the Irish keening. Um, and we'll have two new, uh, two more artists with us next week, Anya Naliri and, uh, and Breedna Nachton will be reading from Riders to the Sea. I want to say thank you to our artists today, to Maven Sean, thank you so much for doing that. I know we, all, we always seem to have technical difficulties, but we are working uh, three and a half thousand miles apart, so I suppose we shouldn't be complaining. It's wonderful to have you. I hope we have you both back again reading with us at some point in the future. Um, you've got great, you're beginning to get a great fan club over here. Uh, to all of you who are watching, thank you so much for being with us. Can I remind you as you, well, first of all, coming very soon, the announcement will be coming over probably in the next week. We are beginning our, ra our radio drama series, which will be as podcasts. Uh, we're going to be doing three radio pieces or radio style dramas between now and the end of the year. Uh, the first one will be um, online in October. I'll have lots more information about that, but it is going to be a well-known horror story transferred to radio style, and um, you're going to love it. And uh, it'll culminate on Halloween, which is when all good horror stories should culminate. But it'll be on for a couple of weeks before that. More information coming in about a week's time. Uh, please remember, we need all the help we can get. Tough times for the arts, tough times for theatre in particular. We cannot sell tickets because we cannot put plays on the stage, but we do need as much support as we can get. Every donation really does count, and we would be deeply grateful if you can send one. You can go to the website and push the donate button. Anything that you can offer us, no matter how small, it all helps. No donation is too small. 
although try to make it a little bit bigger. But uh, any help you can give us, we would really appreciate. We'll be here for you again next week. Thanks for being with us. Bye now.